One thing that I do notice that most amateurs don't do, but every professional does, their entire pre-shot routine before they hit the golf ball because it just makes it more automatic. That's what it is. Whereas amateurs will just sit and hit and hit and hit, and now all of a sudden they're on the golf course, and now they have to go through their pre-shot routine. Well, their body's freaking out. Like, why do we need to do this whole promenade? Why do we need to take four steps and turn around and do this now? Like, this must be a big deal. Where if you do it all the time, it's not a big deal. So that's one element that a lot of amateurs miss, but also in their defense, depending on where they practice, sometimes if there's like a range stalls or something, they don't always have the space to walk into it. But if you do have the space and the time, it's one thing that really helps you pull the trigger even down to once you put the club behind the ball, how long you turn to look and when you come back and how long it takes you to pull the club away. Everything is just one thing after another and it allows things to flow. Golf Smarter. Number 788. Simple tricks amateur golfers can use to play like the pros with Tiffany Fossett of Fighting Golf. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Tiffany. Hey, Fred. Nice to meet you on the podcast. Thanks for having me on Golf Smarter. Thank you so much for being here. I watched a video of yours, and it caught my attention because you talked about the practice swing. And I ha- that's something that's kind of been a pet peeve of mine for years. I watch people take practice swings, and, and as someone who's coached my kids when they were growing up, especially like Little League, because I wasn't playing golf when they were little. But it was like, you never see someone take a practice swing with their bat and stop midway. So why do you take a practice swing and just go right up to the ball and then stop? Or why do you take your practice swing and not have a complete follow through? And then you talked about that and I went, okay, I want to I want to pursue this idea of starting with the practice swing and the value of it and why we do it wrong. Well, we're almost forced to do it wrong. So if you're on the driving range and you have a ball in front of you and you're working on your swing, most people don't want to, quote, waste a range ball. Range balls are expensive or they have a finite supply. They don't want to walk back and get another bucket, right? So they want to make each strike count, but maybe they're working on a particular movement in their backswing or partway down on the downswing or they want to see where the club is. So they almost always balk right at the ball because they didn't intend to hit that ball in the first place, but they were working on a swing mechanic. So because the ball's there, they stop. And you never want to stop in your golf swing. You want to go all the way through. So I'm a huge, huge proponent of rehearsals. How you do your practice swings, how you do any of your rehearsals, that's what finally funnels into your game. And most people don't actually understand how to do a good rehearsal or a good um, practice swing. So part of that, you know, As a teacher, you always have so much going in your head because you really want to help your students. And sometimes you can just see what they need, but you don't have it at the time. You're like, gosh, if I only had this. And so that actually led me to making this little product called the Impact Improver. And it's just this, like almost like a shield that slides right on top of your iron and you hit it a Velcro ball. And because the ball is Velcro and it's not going to go anywhere, you can just swing on through. So you actually finally start making the practice swing you wanted to do Or if you wanted to do a rehearsal at 10 miles an hour, that works too. So it allows people to work at different speeds and different length swings. So I can get people to do stuff with this fuzzy little red ball that I can't get them to do with a real golf ball. Because it's not intimidating, they don't care. For whatever reason, a real golf ball freaks people out, gets in their head, makes them think stuff. But this is more like a toy. And you'll do things in your living room that you will never do on the range. Because people are watching you on the range, but people are hopefully not watching you in your living room. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. It's true. Uh, That's that's really fascinating. I love that you call it a rehearsal, too. But even on the course, before you step up to the tee or you step up to the ball, there's guys who take many, many, many rehearsal swings. What are we looking for? Too many. I mean, one is really all you need. Sometimes you don't need any. Two max. 
You should never need any more than two practice swings ever. And the only time you ever need two is if you're on an uneven line. Mm. So most of all your practice in your life is done on a flat range. So you're pretty much covered on the tee box, right? That shouldn't take you a long time. That should just be like a no-brainer. But you've got an uneven lie. You're trying to sense where your weight is, where the club's going to bottom out. All right, that's when you need a couple practice swings because you're trying to sense where the club's going to bottom out. And that's different. So other than that, you shouldn't need a lot of practice swings. And if you've done your practice right and you've done your rehearsals proper, you have a sense of your weight shift and your timing. So most people always practice too fast. The whole game wants speed right now. How can I hit it further? How can I hit it further? I got to go faster to hit it further, right? Correct the mundo. But if you're out of balance, you've done nothing. So the slower you make a rehearsal, the more you feel where your weight shift is, where you have awareness, because it takes a while for it to get back to your brain, the message. So you've got to figure out how to do things perfectly, very slowly to be able to go very fastly and explode. So that's the beauty. Most people don't realize Really good players that have learned how to swing very fast have done so many rehearsals and learned to swing super slow. It's ridiculous. I've noticed a lot of women have a very slow, deliberate swing. I don't get the chance to play with a lot of women, but I, I live next to a country club, and so I, I watch people play all day long. And, you know, Thursdays is Lady Day, so there's all these groups of women that come out. But I notice a lot of them, their, their slow, their swing is very slow, wide, and and deliberate. Um, I I I don't really understand, like, why they do that. Or is that just, <laughs> <laughs> that just not working the for them? A lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, most people have the idea in their head: if I have a wider arc, I will hit it further. Mm. And that makes sense to a certain ideal deal. But the swing isn't actually a complete circle. It's kind of a circle and a bit more of a V on the downswing because you've got to hit down on it. So the more you make it a giant circle, you're probably going to hit behind the ball a bit. So if you've, you've you know, I know you talk to instructors all the time and your, your listeners are very avid in, in listening to these types of things. There's, um, years ago, there used to be kind of a philosophy of on the backswing, you want to have a wide arc, and then you want things to get a little bit closer to you and fall down. So you're always moving towards the target. So if your arms go away from you on the downswing, you're probably going to hit it fast. So if you watch most better players and you slow it down, their hands are actually getting a little closer to their body as they get down. That's how they're going to hit the ball, did, did it in front of the ball. So the reason why you see a lot of long, slow swings is they think, if I have a bigger arc, I hit it further. And that's just a little bit of a misconception. Absolutely. But people, yeah, we talk about going from the range to the course and your, your practice swings and your, you know, your limited practice swing on the range because you don't want to waste a ball. Um, and then you don't take a full rehearsal swing and have a complete follow through. Um, and so many people believe that they are a scratch golfer on the driving range and why they can't understand why they're an 18 handicap once they step up to the first tee. Well, in their defense, most people's practice swings are better than their real swings because they just let the club fly. But when they're over the ball, they're always just thinking about how fast can I twist my hips, how fast can I turn, and that movement generally makes them start coming over the top. Where when they're swinging, they're swinging freely and their arms are going more towards the target, the club head's going more down the line. But then they get over the ball and they swing much faster with the ball than they do even in their normal practice swing. Because when you don't have an object, you can't go as fast. So mm -hmm. I don't think anyone's actual practice swing is as fast as their swing with the ball. Hmm. But let's talk about making contact and why your products, which we'll talk a lot more about in a little bit, um, the contact and you said it, a V at the bottom of your swing. That's kind of new to me because I always thought that you want to have a nice circular motion with the bottom of your swing being in front of the ball. It is circular, and I wish this was where we had a TV, right? So yeah. if your hands keep leading, 
through impact, right? So on the downswing, your hands keep going down, 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 down. If they're going to move past the golf ball, because of that, the club will fall down, boom, last minute. It's an arc. It's more of a V. It is not actually a U-shaped swing. So when people try and make a, quote, u shaped circle swing, their hands usually stay back and the club head passes their hands. That's the flip. That's the fin shot. And so it's a weird thing. You can't actually think about it, but if you draw it, that's what it is. And so if you feel the weight of it drop, it smacks it down. Sorry for that for you listeners, but just woke you up. Uh, <laughs> I just smacked my hands, but uh, sound effects are good, right? It, it goes down. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. All right, listen, we're going to take a quick time out. We'll be back right after this. Let's meet you. <laughs> where are you based? <laughs> I, I know a little about you, and uh, where do you where do you teach? Uh, I'm currently in Ashburn, Virginia. I teach here eight months out of the year at 1757 Golf Academy. So that's about 30 minutes from Washington, D.C. And then in the summer months from June to September, I teach in Nantucket at Nantucket Golf Club. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm truly lucky because um, Nantucket's one of the best golf courses in the country, and you don't have to sweat the entire summer. And here in 1757, it's a really busy golf course and have a big clientele, and it's just fun. So it's like half the year is like cheers. Do you remember the show Cheers? And everyone came in, it was comfortable and had a good, like cheers for eight months of the year, and then really like great facilities and just like the most, like being in golf heaven for four months. So oh, I'm, I'm lucky. Yes, you are. So tell me, how, what was the path that got you to be a golf instructor? I was bored. Oh, so. now you got to fill in the blanks on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had never played golf. I was 17 years old, and I played a lot of other sports and things like that. Um, but I didn't play golf because I didn't have any friends that played. And my dad had always wanted me to play golf, but, like, who cared, right? And he was walking out the door one day, and I grew up in a beach town. And it was all kind of cloudy and rainy. And I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to hit balls. And I was like, oh. I said, I thought you wanted me to learn how to play golf. He goes, if you start, you're not going to stop. I'm like, that's what mom said about shaving my legs. I want to go. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so which one do you like better? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So he took me to the range, and like all beginners, I whiffed and I whiffed. But when I connected, it was good. And he got all excited, and he was like, I'm getting you lessons tomorrow. And he was right. I've been playing ever since. Wow. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And yeah, one thing led to another, and I played professionally for 11 years. And then after that, it was a real crossroads. Whenever you decide to stop doing something that you love because you aren't having as much success as you want to have. In 1997, I was the number one ranked amateur in the country, so I thought I was going to have, you know, extreme success as a professional. And I, I made a lot of cuts and did a lot, but I wasn't holding any trophies. And so it was time to, to change gears. And um, it was very bittersweet. And I didn't know if I would ever play golf again, you know, because it's like that's how much it hurt. But when I started to fill out applications and think about things, I was like, I have 20 years of incredible experience inside the ropes with the best players in the world. It's like, this is really what I know, right? And um, so I tried it, and I thought I would hate it. And weirdly enough, I love it. The I, teaching I mean, part. like, yeah, like I never, ever thought I would teach anyone. I remember when I was playing, because everyone's like, you can't think about anything. You don't need to know. You just need to react. You know, you're supposed to go out and be a five hour drilling drone. So in pro ams, I was mortified if anybody asked me a question. I was like, good God, because I wanted to be all in my own little head. I didn't want to think about anybody else and da, da, da. And it, it just amazes me that I teach people golf now. But weirdly enough, I have a bit of a knack for it. So it's fun. Oh, that's a fabulous story. Tell, share some of your stories when you played professionally. I love these kind of stories. Because you can't ask these questions when, when the person's on the tour. They're very cautious about that but um you said you didn't have any trophies but you had enough success to keep going oh yeah i mean i made most every cut um but i just you know i would start out really well i was an over practicer and over time you realize you do things wrong and sometimes everybody does everything with good intent but intent doesn't mean anything if you burn yourself out 
or you practice too hard. So, you know, there's people that really care and they want to play great in their club championship and they practice three hours a day, every day before the thing. And they're worn out because they never practice at all. So they can't handle it. Right. So I was under that badge of honor a while back. It used to be, you have to dig it in the dirt. You need to hit a thousand balls a day and da da da. So I would just practice dawn till dusk. Like it was my badge of honor to be the last one there, to be the last one on the putting green. And so I was just exhausting myself. So by the end of the week, I didn't have anything left in the tank and you mentally kind of flake out. And, but it was like, I wanted to be known as the hardest worker. Well, didn't matter. That was actually stupid. Um, you know, so you learn things and I'm able to help a lot of my students better because I understand the pitfalls and they're not doing anything wrong. They just want to be better. They don't understand what it takes to get better. So, you know, there was lots of ev evolutions, but, um, you know, as far as stories from tour, there's just, there's so many. And then there's not many. Like I remember, <laughs> um, I'd never been overseas and I decided to go play on the Asian tour. And there were about 25 Americans going and a different friend of mine that had played at university of central Florida. I played my college golf at Florida state. We went over there and our first tournament was in Bangkok, Thailand. And we were playing a practice round and it was super hot and it was horrible. And when you made the turn there was like a little bridge and it was it was stupid hot it was like do you remember which hot. course do you remember which course i do not i tried to block this out after i tell you the story <laughs> and you don't know why because i've so, played in, i've played in thailand once <laughs> yeah so it was like 110 degrees and you had to walk over this bridge and half the bridge was shaded and half of it wasn't so anybody with half the sense is going to walk in the shade so i go the shade and my friend stops at the hut to get a gatorade and as I'm walking across the bridge, a snake drops out of the tree, wraps around my leg and bites me. And oh. so I don't know what to do. And I pull this snake off my leg and I chuck it into the river. And you have little, um, I have, I have caddies that don't speak English. Speak English. They, no. yeah, they speak Thai. And, and, and they're, they're women. sitting, yeah, they're freaking oh, out. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I go back to my friend. I'm like, Kristen, what do you think? Can we play the back nine? She's like, you idiot, you could die. Like, I was like, I'm not thinking I could die. So we're trying to find someone to speak English. They rush me to the hospital. I get into this emergency room. I have a, a doctor and four nurses. And the doctor goes, oh, was snake fast? I'm like, what? He said, was snake fast? I was like, was it fast? I'm like, aren't all snakes fast? Like, I don't know. Mine was in flight. I threw it off my leg. And he said, if they're poisonous, they're a little slower because they have back me up. If they're super fast, they're non-poisonous because they need to be able to get away. And I'm like, well, gee, that's kind of interesting. I don't know. Now I'm really freaked out. So <laughs> they gave me anti-venom pills, all this kind of stuff. And so I got to the, the course the next day and all the caddies were like touching my hair and wanting me to sign their uniforms. And I'm like, this is really weird. And I, it turns out I was the only person ever to be bitten at that golf course by a snake that didn't die. So they thought I was like some sort of goddess or something. So it was very bizarre. And I was just really glad to get home because I was taking all sorts of pills and medicine taken in a foreign language. I couldn't read it. I didn't know what it was, but I'm like, if I don't take this, I might die. And if I do take this, I might die. So here we go. Roll the dice. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what to say. <laughs> you were the only person to never die from a snake bite at a golf course at this golf exactly. course. Exactly. And then then just as everything with rumors get bigger and bigger, it was hilarious. So I finally oh, get yeah. back to the States and I go to my home golf course. And my home golf course, right when you park, the putting green's right there. And I walk up and some of the old ladies are there on the putting green putting and they were so sweet and I, I missed them. And they're like, oh, we're so glad you're back. And they're like, is it true? Is it really true? And I'm like, what? And they're like, did your caddy really die sucking the venom out of your leg? One of the members of Star that. So it's been like a hilarious story for my whole life, but that's probably what I remember the most. Oh yeah, no, that's you're done. That was yeah. that was the story I was hoping for. <laughs> Did your leg swell up? Um, no, luckily it didn't. I think I had more effects from the, the medicine that they gave me than anything else. Like, you know, I was nauseous. I was seeing like little purple dots and the girls thought it was hilarious. So they, other tour players were getting like rubber snakes and putting them under my pillows and stuff and things like that in my hotel room. <laughs> so oh, it went on for a athletes, while. Athletes, athletes, <laughs> sick a sense of humor you can possibly imagine. Yeah. Oh man, that is too good. All right, we're going to... Uh... <laughs> 
Uh, we're going to take a break. <laughs> I, need, I need to catch my breath on that one. We'll be right back. Sorry. <laughs> Another podcast from the Golf Smarter Network of Podcasts is Radio Baseball Cards. The host for the show is the late Hall of Fame pitcher for the Dodgers, Don Drysdale. Each episode is only 90 seconds long, and here's a taste of last week's episode featuring Joe Carter reminiscing about the wacky personalities he encountered in the minor leagues. Here's another radio baseball card. Joe Carter was the second player chosen in the 1981 draft after an outstanding collegiate career at Wichita State University. Then it was time to become a pro. I first went to Double A, and the first guys I meet were Mel Hall, Mike Diaz, Henry Mack, and a guy by the name of Tim Milner. And all four of these guys had just shaved their heads. And the other guy, Mike Diaz, had a mohawk. If you're a fan of baseball, or of history, or of baseball history, follow us and enjoy these amazing and amusing stories as told by the greatest players of the 20th century. That's Radio Baseball Cards with Don Drysdale from wherever you find your favorite podcasts. So I did play in Thailand one time. I think it was Blue Canyon Country Club. And it was, you know, Tiger's mom was... um, from Thailand, and so he was really popular there. And when he played there, they had plaques when Tiger made it to he hit it to here, and he made it from here, and right all these different things. Well, his mom was called Tita, but they called her Tita, right? Mm-hmm. In the woods. I got a dog. I got a puppy about a now. She's gone now, but it was she lived to about fourteen, and we were trying to come up with a name. And it was my birthday present. So it was like, I want to come up with a name for my dog. Everybody in the family said, how about this name? How about this name? I'm like, no, no, no. This is going to be my, I want to come up with a name. And I would love to come up with a golf name for it. But, I, you know, Divot, yeah, everyone's got Divot, Bogey, eh, bad. You know, I couldn't come up with a name. And so a cousin said, well, why don't you name it after Tiger's, Tiger's mom? I'm like, <gasps> you, did you, you did not. You did not. So we gave him the name Tita. I was like, Tita. It's like. Um, but I ask him, I'm going, why would I name, a, you said you wanted a golf name. I said, yeah, but Tiger's mom? He goes, yeah, if you name it Dog Tita with your last name, the dog's name is Tita Green. That's actually cute. <laughs> <laughs> now I get it. Before, I was like, that's blasphemous. That's bad. Yeah. But now it's like actually really funny. Isn't that a great name? Tita that's Green. Like, that's good. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you you had two words in that really jumped out at me. Over practicer. Okay? I think that there are people who will go out and get two, three, four buckets and be there for hours pounding ball after ball after ball. Never take a practice swing. Just sweep and hit and sweep and hit. You know, sweep another ball in front of them and hit it. Are they learning anything? Are they accomplishing anything? Are they just reinforcing yes, bad habits? Yes and no. I mean, I just think it's fun to hit things. And so if they're out there and they're doing it. I'll stay at arm's length. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah. And they're they're hitting because they, like, want to work out and stuff. But the guy that's already um, just frustrated and he just keeps hitting balls because he's mentally stuck, he's doing more damage than good. And so, like, when I was saying I over-practice, like, sometimes I would just stay three hours on the putting green because somebody else was there and I needed to be the last one gone. Well, I wasn't getting anything out of that. That was over practicing at that point. That's just stupid. Um, so some pe- times people just don't allocate their time well, and you can't cram, like for a test, you can cram. You can study all night. Maybe it works. Generally it doesn't, but a lot of times it did. But you can't really cram for golf. You know, you can't say, I got a tournament tomorrow. I haven't practiced in three months. Let me just go hit nine buckets of balls today, and I'll be ready tomorrow. Right. right. It's right. like it, it's kind of small bits over time, continuous all the time that pays off. And so what is the purpose of I mean, is there value in hitting a bucket of balls and what should you be focused on? Oh, yeah, there's plenty of value. You got to hit balls like you're yeah. not going to be a good golfer if you don't hit balls. You just go out and play golf. That's not playing golf. Right. So you've kind of have to decide what you're working on, but your mechanics create your feels. It's not the other way around. So anybody that ever tells me they're a feel player, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're a mechanical player. Every feel you get becomes off your mechanics. 
They just don't realize that they're just sensing the feel. And so they're like, I'm a field player. No, every player is both a mechanical and a field player. And so you might not like to hear it because you don't want to think about it, but hence where your club is, where your body is, that's a mechanic. Your feels are off your mechanics. Um, so what should they be thinking about? Well, a lot of times that's just dependent on the person. If they're brand new, they might have to think how to grip the club. They might have to think where to put their feet. Now, if they're a really good player, they might be trying to sense their weight shift through through a particular thing. They might be trying to figure out how their left hand turns down. So it really depends on the person when they're practicing. Do I want to try and hit every one of these seven irons into the small bunker on the left side? I think it's really good on the range to try and hit into a bunker versus onto the green because the bunker is much smaller than the green, right? So you minimize your target. So it depends on what you want to do. But one thing that I do notice that most amateurs don't do, but every professional does, most professionals do their entire pre-shot routine before they hit the golf ball because it just makes it more automatic. That's what it is, right? Um, whereas amateurs will just sit and hit and hit and hit, and now all of a sudden they're on the golf course, and now they have to go through their pre-shot routine. Well, their body's freaking out. Like, why do we need to do this whole promenade? Why do we need to take four steps and turn around and do this now? Like, this must be a big deal, right? Where if you do it all the time, it's not a big deal. So that's one element that a lot of amateurs miss, but also in their defense, depending on where they practice, sometimes if there's like a range stalls or something, they don't always have the space to walk into it. But if you do have the space and the time, it's one thing that really helps you pull the trigger even down to, you know, once you put the club behind the ball, how long you turn to look and when you come back and how long it takes you to pull the club away. I mean, everything is just one thing after another and it, it allows things to flow. Excellent. Um, but what about these people? I mean, you've, you've got to have lessons in between these things so you have something specific you want to work on because it's just like, ah, I'm not hitting my six iron well. Well, you're just going there to hit your six iron? Do you think, you know, maybe you're allergic to your six iron this week and then you get it in your head that your six iron is a bad club for you where it's probably not the club at that point. Correct, Mundo. Um, the longer the club, obviously, most everybody's swing is their swing, and, but they're not as penalized with shorter clubs as longer clubs, right? So it's a couple inches longer, so you're going to bottom out more. So it's more important to have the club in a better position where you can come from the inside. So the more you come over the top with a longer club, the more you're going to have to stand up to make space for it. At some point in time, you can only get so tall. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So that's why with your three wood, it doesn't really you can't pull it off, but you might be able to pull it off with your eight iron. And so people think they have an entirely different swing with their three wood and they don't. They just don't have enough space to grow because the club's so out of position. Well, that brings me to a topic that has been on the Golf Smarter community for a while now, because I've been uh, playing these single length irons. Um, for a month or two now, and and uh, we, we ha we've had conversation with the CEO of one of the companies that makes them called One Iron Golf. Uh, have you ever tried? Have you ever played? And what's your? Do you have any thoughts about single length irons and the value of them? Since they're all the same length, and you can get that swing consistently in your body position and everything. Right. I haven't played them, but they make a lot of sense. Theoretically, it makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. because you are all of a sudden used to being in one setup position, which your setup position is always the same from your hip hinge down, your body posture. But the angle in your wrist will be different based on if you have a sandwich or a three wood because the lie angle is a little different. So your your wrist have to tip just a little bit different. But that's that's already a given based on how the club sits on the ground. So if you have a one length irons the whole time, you the way your wrist set feel the same all the time and you don't have to worry so much about some other things. So it, it looks the same the, as you're standing over the ball, the ball looks the same distance away. So, you know, with a sand wedge, it's going to look one thing with a three wood, it looks like four miles away. Right. So yeah. um, if now you're not going back and forth between a pitching wedge and a four iron, you know, and it's all the same. So 
your brain kind of calms down where some people are like, oh, am I standing the right distance? Am I this, that, or the other? So I have never actually done it, but it does make a lot of sense. Now, I think to be able to do it, you have to have enough speed in your swing to pull it off because the length of the clubs, you know, dynamics, that's why it should go a little further. But hypothetically, if you don't have any speed, (laughs) they're all going to go the same distance anyway. So you have to have enough speed to make them go different distances. Well, I... Yes and no, because you're going to be hitting your distances. I mean, uh, seeing Bryson, who's playing these single-length uh, irons and clubs, um, hitting uh, 168 yards and pulling out his nine iron, that's crazy, right, for, for anybody else. But I know for me, so far, what I've been experiencing is I'm getting more comfortable with them, is that they're fairly accurate to the distances that I'm u- I'm comfortable with iron to iron, like my five iron to my five, five iron ping to my five iron, one iron golf, fairly, you know, close. And so I can set them apart and go, okay, yeah, this is going to be 130 yards. I'm going to pull out this one. hundred percent. Yeah. I hope you don't misunderstand what I said, meaning like you have to have enough speed, like Bryson or a man with some speed, maybe um, a kid that doesn't have a lot of speed or an older woman that doesn't have a lot of speed. I see. You have to have a certain amount of speed period. If you're clubs are single length or different lengths to have different distances between your irons. Like a lot of women start golf and they're like, all my clubs go the same distance. Well, they don't have any swing speed to begin with. That's why everything is going the same distance. So they're better off to hit something with more loft because it's easier for them to hit because if they make contact with their nine iron or their five iron, it's really not going to go any significant difference because their swing speed is so low to begin with. Oh, Oh, that makes so much sense now. Okay. Because I, I've i played numerous times with people who are fairly new to the game, and mm-hmm. they were like, uh, should I hit my 8-iron here? I'm like, well, how far do you hit your 8-iron? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, then I really can't help you. <laughs> I mean, you know? <laughs> and, and he's like, no, I, you know, I seem to be hitting most of these clubs around the same distance, so which one should I hit? It's like, if you're hitting the same distance, then why are you carrying so many clubs? Yeah, exactly. So we hit, hit hit the one with the most loft, the one that's easiest for you to hit and go from there. But yeah, so that's what you said. Yeah. So if you have single distance clubs, you you would get different distances if you're strong enough to have different distances. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now that makes a lot of sense to me. It's like, I generally say, what do you feel the most comfortable with? Hit that one. <laughs> well, no th- you can't go wrong with that answer either. So you're covered. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to Tiffany Fossett and uh, with, with we're going to talk about your product uh, and you're at impactimprover.com. We're going to talk about your product after we hear about what's on Golf Smarter Mulligans this week. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans number 104 and the seventh in our nine consecutive episodes dedicated to the lessons of the late Tony Manzoni. Tony talks about his idol Ben Hogan and a very close friend that any fan of golf history would know about. One thing Venturi told me when I worked with him, and it was really true, is that you can make that little lateral slide towards the target as far as you want. There is a point where your body will turn automatically. It's just that when you make the lateral slide and stop is when you hit that coil to the right. But if you make that little bump where you transfer your weight and just keep going, you will just rotate like crazy. But it's a wonderful feeling because it's a powerful feeling. Where we get into trouble is when we have weight on the right foot as we're hitting the golf ball. Then you can't turn to the left. You just can't do it. And that's where you get lower back problems when you don't get over to the left side before your rotation. You have to get on that left side. That's why setting up Mm 60-40, you're closer to the pivot point because we're pivoting around the left leg. The left leg is the axis for the right-handed player. That's Tony Manzoni on episode 104 of Golf Smarter Mulligans being released this Friday. Learn more about Tony on our website at golfsmarter.com slash Tony. His book, The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, is available on Amazon, and his DVD of the same name can now only be seen online through our private channel. To gain access, please write to me directly by clicking on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Please follow both so that you can get a brand new episode of either when it downloads to your favorite listening device. You 
briefly touched about on your, your product uh, a little earlier. When did you become an inventor? I don't know. You know, I always like walk around and think of ideas and I'm like, somebody should make that. And, this, and I would always say it and I never do it. And then all of a sudden I'd see this thing come to life that I had already thought about. And I'm like, that's <laughs> annoying. And so um, it just happened one night in my basement. I started goofing around. I was preparing for a clinic I had the next day. And it's hard when you have big groups and stuff. And I'm like, how can I demonstrate better? How can I get them to show some stuff? So I was just um, in my basement swinging. And when you start teaching all the time, you don't get a lot of time to practice or play anymore. Yeah. And so I had gone through a stint where I had just taught so many hours and I hadn't even touched my golf clubs. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to have to hit some balls tomorrow. I should probably go down to my basement and at least swing. And as I was making my beautiful practice swing rehearsals that we've been talking about, I was like, man, it really feels good. I'm like, I want to hit a ball right now. I really feel like hitting a ball. And I debated. I'm like, and I've got a ball right next to me. And I'm like, is it worth it? Should I hit this right through my drywall right now? Maybe. <laughs> and I'm like, that's the dumbest thought ever. And I was like, and then I looked down and I was like, it'd be really cool if this ball would just stick to my face so I could swing at something but not hurt anything. And then I'm like, well, damn, why doesn't it? And I started like grabbing things and making stuff and I figured it out. And I'm like, that's all you need because I can now just hold it up and show people like on the Velcro over the toe, like this would happen if you hit it there and whatever. But now you can swing indoors safely. You don't need a huge net or if you're traveling, you've got something to do. So it was really, again, like I said, teachers are always thinking about how they can help their students more, how they can show them something, how they can do something. And so I just... When I got that one, I was like, I got a little obsessed with it. And then I was like, well, one thing led to another. And then I found a designer. Then I found a manufacturer. Then I found a this. And then, and then I'm like, I don't know how to do any of this. And somehow it all happened. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. That is great. And so the product is called Impact Improver. And uh, it's available on both Amazon and on your website? Correct. At impactimprover.com? Correct. And you want to tell us the price? The price is twenty nine ninety five. It comes with a shield that fits on top of your irons. Um, I only have it for right-handed. Sorry, lefties. Um, it comes with uh, four Velcro balls inside. And, um, Are they like Nerf balls? I mean, it, Yeah, they're it, like little Velcro balls. So the, it, the balls, the soft part. Does it feel part, like you know, the hitting a ball? The, yeah, the Velcro. What's cool about it is when you hit it really hard, and this was a happy accident, right? So you, it's like Christmas when your prototypes come in. You're like, oh, my God, is this going to work? And it's so exciting, right? And so the first time I put it on, I'm like, oh, my God, I hope this stays on the club and doesn't fly off, right? And like, So it stays on the club. I'm like, okay, yay, step one, right? Step two, I put the ball down. I hit it, and I hear this. Dunk, and I'm like, oh, it makes a noise. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Because I guess what happens is when you hit it, and if you hit it in the, in the sweet spot, where the air must compress or something. I have no idea. But it'll make a little bit of a noise, which makes it fun. Now, it's yeah. not like a ding, but you know. And so it's really quite cool. So um, the balls are the soft kind of, but you know how you have Velcro, you have the yeah. soft part, and then you have the scratchy part. So the scratchy part sits on the shield that attaches to your club, and the soft part's on the ball. So the cool thing about these little balls is – it's good when you use with a shield because you'll see where you're striking. But after a while, like all golfers, you want to see something fly. So just take the shield off. You can hit these little red balls into your wall. It won't hurt the paint. It won't hurt anything. Like the foam balls are a little hard. It will go chip through the something. drywall. Yeah. <laughs> so I hit them into mirrors. I do anything I want with them. And so they won't fly perfect aerodynamically. But the, the thing is that if you're inside your house, you probably only have so much space for the ball to fly anyways. Right? Wow. Um so when it allows you to work on your pre-shot, you can see your hand set up, you can pull it away, you can hit it, and you can watch it fly. And it'll fly relatively straight and stuff like that. So it's, it's helpful to, to propel something. Well, I, while you're describing it, uh, the thing that came to my mind is that you're going to see where you're striking the ball on the, on the face of the club. You're going to see if you're getting a good center hit, right? Exactly. Or and if that's you're hitting it off the toe or off the heel. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people, like, when we're doing our things, you don't ever want any hangers, right? So that's yeah, a thin right. shot. So most people are always trying to lift the ball up. Uh -huh. Hence, that's your circle. Okay. So we've got to be coming down this way 
to hit a ball, to trap it. Yeah. So it's a visual oh, a thing. Bonus. Yeah. So you can't ever see that when you swing, but if someone shows you that in a instructional, oh, I get now. Da, 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 da. So there's all sorts of fun little ways to goof around with it. So it fits about 90% irons. It won't fit hybrid irons or something with a really big fat top line. But mm-hmm. I just tell people, hey, if you ordered it and it doesn't fit your club, just send it back. I'll, I'll return it. So that, that was the hardest thing. Like, it's a good idea, but you've got to have tons of cash or be a huge manufacturer to understand how to make something for everything. So I've got something here that's pretty good. It fits most things, but um, my next product, I'll be much smarter. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny you, you apologize for not having it for lefties. We have a listener uh, who I communicate. He, he writes to me all the time. His name is Rick, and he's in Florida, and he's a lefty. And so he gets really frustrated when they're not available for left-handed pieces. Rick, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do feel actually really bad. And there are so many lefties. But the, the red balls I do sell independently. So you can at least, that's something. I'm so <laughs> sorry, lefties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Now, the other thing that caught my attention. Oh, wait, did you tell me the price? Twenty nine ninety five. But 20. anybody that's listening to your Golf Smarter podcast, if they put in Golf Smarter in the discount code, they get twenty percent off. Oh, awesome! Thank you. Yeah, and happy is to that, help. And is that also uh, just on on the website, not on Amazon? Yeah, or? just on my website. Yeah, okay. again, certain things, learning curves. My main passion is teaching people golf, and so to learn all the algorithms and how to set discount codes on Amazon, that just takes up too much brain space. I figured out how to do it on my website, but I don't know how to do it there. <laughs> oh, the other thing that caught my attention about uh, wanting to talk to you was uh, your book, Fighting Golf. I love the logo of it because it was my initials. So it's like, oh, okay, that'll get me excited. <laughs> stupid things like that. My wife's going, really? Why do you always do that? Tell me about your book and why Um, fighting golf? Because I believe any place in your golf swing, you're either balanced or you're not. And fighting is primal. And so is swinging a golf club. It's very much a primal motion. So I wanted to have a catchy title, but all human motion is the same. And you're either balanced, powerful, and leveraged, or you're not. So if you're out of position when you're fighting, you're going to get killed. You've got to be leveraged and stacked. And so I go throughout the book and I take someone soup to nuts, how they should stand to it, how they should grip it, and throughout the swing. And I relate it through movements that you're used to doing every day and drills. And it's um, it was a it was a fun thing to do. How long did it take you to write that book? A lot. I wrote it five times. First time I wrote it, I was like, this is horrible. No one's going to read this because one of my goals was I used to get golf books and I never finished them. They were just too uh, 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 and boring. And I'm like, how am I going to make a book that someone would read end to end? Right. And so it took a long time, but then I think I finally chunked it down and made it kind of digestible and good. And so the final result, I'm, I'm pretty pleased, but there's always things that you wish you could do again, but at some point in time, you have to finish, right? You have to finish at mm-hmm. some point. And the other thing about golf books, you know, be, besides being, uh, 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 they uh, lo- they can be long. And long, I think, long golf books are are also really hard to digest. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 this is not long. I forgot how many pages it is. It is like 135 pages, That's but cool. it moves quick. And there's some lots pretty of big illustrations pictures. and pictures. And, yeah. Oh yeah. By visual stuff, but I take you through your bones and what you need to know and injuries. And there's a lot in this little thing, but I don't waste a lot of time. I'm one of those people that tend to just get to the point. Excellent. <laughs> so I could, the same thing you can say in one paragraph, you could pull it out to five, but why do yeah, that? Right. I mean, like five pages. <laughs> Again, yeah. available on both. On- uh, yeah, on impactimprover.com. You can get it on Kindle on Amazon, but oh, cool. yeah, probably just, I, everything's 20% off, so it's just easier to go to impactimprover.com. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but you can find all this stuff on Amazon too, uh, so it just depends on what kind of person you are. If you're a prime person or you're a, I'll go on the web person. Yeah, go on the web. Take advantage <laughs> of the uh, discount code, Gol- golf smarter, one word. 20% off of anything you buy on her website. 
right? Mm -hmm. on, on your yep. website. Oh, Tiffany, it was really a lot of fun to, to talk to you. I hope we got some good nuggets out of this for the audience, but boy, I had fun. Thanks I so had much. fun. So nice. Thank you for having me on the show. And thank you to all the listeners out there. Um, golf's a small world. And big love to all the golfers out there because all golfers love to hit things, want to be better, are constantly frustrated that we're not better, and but we still keep at it. So more power to you and good luck. I have to share this fun story with you about the 2021 Masters. If you've been listening for a while, you know that, one, I don't follow the Pro Tour very closely, and two, gambling ain't my thing. But my son is quite the opposite, at least when it comes to putting money on the line, whether it's during his round or for a major. So this past week, he set up what he called a golf pool unlike any other that started out with a few friends and colleagues and turned into a 90-person global pool with a $25 buy-in. Of course, Dad reluctantly obliged and made my contribution and my picks. Rules were fairly straightforward. You, you selected your players from six different tiers based on the world golf rankings, and the best four golfers from each team count towards your team score. If a golfer misses the cut, they're assigned a score of 80. At the end of each round, he would send out an email that was more of a roast than a daily recap. Long story short, his selections included the winner, Hideki Matsuyama, Will Zalatoris, Jordan Spieth, and John Rahm, who all ended up in the top five. He also picked Rory McIlroy and Jason Day, who didn't make the cut, but they didn't count because you only take your top four. With those picks... He won the pool by an impressive five strokes over the second place finisher. And where did his father, whom he introduced to the group on the Friday recap with, you may host the number one amateur golf podcast, but your pro picks are absolute trash. You were given six picks. Five didn't make the cut. Way to go, dad. Love you. That was on the second day. Well, how badly did I do? His minus 32 at the end beat me by 94 strokes, <laughs> but it gets worse. My plus 62 was 27 strokes behind the second to last place team who was at plus 35. So his final email included a lot of trash talk, including to me, I beat you by 94 strokes. Now, I'm your daddy. Oh, my picks? The only one made the cut, and that was my long shot of Abraham Ansir. My four others, Daniel Berger, Matt Kuchar, Danny Willett, and Dustin Johnson didn't play on the weekend. And my last guy, Matthew Wolf, was DQ'd. Moral of the story? Just like on the golf course, let it go. Follow at Golf Smarter in social media and check out our video episode tease on Instagram. It's a good way to share and introduce Golf Smarter to your friends. Also, please subscribe to Golf Smarter TV on YouTube. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions on what you'd like to hear on an upcoming interview, or maybe you have some ideas on what we should do to celebrate episode 800, I'd love to hear from you. Just click on the Hey Fred button at GolfSmarter.com.